pushing a couple settings here. My name is Grant McAllister. I am Associate Professor and Levison Faculty Fellow at Wake Forest University in the Department of German and Russian. I am one of the three co-conveners here. Welcome to tonight's presentation. We look forward uh, to your uh, participation and thank you for joining us. We've got a full screen for you tonight uh, with lots of entertaining uh, and informed uh, commentary tonight. And I wanted to um, tell you that today, if you've not been joining us, uh, one of the focuses that we have of this conference and a special focus in today with our walk on session with Martha Hartley, um, talking about the history of enslaved here in Salem in the Hidden Town Project. In our morning conversations, we were talking about um, worked with John Sensbach, who was going to be closing our um, academic portion of the conference tomorrow morning in a public session that you can tune in at 10 o'clock is our next time we'll get together after tonight to talk about the themes of this conference. And, and John and Martha and other folks around here like Mel White, Daniel Cruz, were all inspired to do a lot of work in the 90s and the aughts on the story of uh, the um, Old, well, the oldest uh, historic Black Moravian congregation in the country, um, and that's uh, now St. Philip's Moravian here in Winston-Salem. The church that was started in 1822, which is the last official year of our conference, and, and it's a bookmark for us in a change in, in race relations here in the Moravian community. But uh, it was in part because of the inspired leadership of the longtime uh, pastor of that congregation that uh, those individual researchers were attracted to, to that field of interest. And Dr. Cedric Rodney served as pastor at, um, at uh, St. Philip's in 68, uh, retired in 2003. He had two tours there uh, as a pastor. And um, it, but well, he physically and his family are a part of our introductory bridge tonight because it's the Rodney family's presence both in the Moravian community and in our host partners tonight at Winston-Salem State that we're celebrating. Because it was at Winston-Salem State, 2003, uh, he met his future bride, uh, Dr. May Rodney, the director of the library there, and we're so glad that she's here with us tonight. And uh, we're going to welcome to now uh, two professors in the Department of History, Politics, and Social Justice, um, uh, Cynthia Villagomez, Mr. James Blackwell. And Cynthia, you are, are going to do our introductions this evening. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to express my gratitude to the co-conveners. Thank you so much for organizing tonight's keynote address and our discussions, but also for the whole, every program. You've been very courageous because you challenged us to not only think with our minds, but to truly think with our hearts. And you've developed these bridges of reconciliation and healing, and that's very important. And so I am very, very humbled and honored to welcome everyone and to represent my historically black college, Winston-Salem State University. And on behalf of my university, I bring warm greetings. So I will mention um, that tonight's program is sponsored by our Dean, Dr. Dean Scriven, also by our Dean, Associate Dean, uh, Lavi Lejour, who's the Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences from our Provost's office. Uh, my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Kathy Stitz, who's the associate provost, uh, who is a senior associate provost and dean of University College. I also bring greetings from my chair, Dr. Denise Nation. She's chair of the Department of History, Politics, and Social Justice, and a daughter of the Caribbean, native-born Jamaican. And our, our department, by the way, was the long-term home of, um, of Dr. Rodney. And so that's quite an honor. I also will mention Dr. Donna Benson, who's our US historian, senior professor. And then finally, Ms. Marion Roberts, 
from Tobago, who is our uh, associate um, in our department, who had made many arrangements to welcome everyone, but especially um, our Reverend uh, Kirton Roberts. And so we regret that we weren't able to have you on our campus, um, but she's listening and she's actually brought in virtually um, the last person I'll mention, Dr. the very darling and wonderful Dr. Ruby Rodney, who's Professor Emerita of English at WSSU and a long time one of the most esteemed um, elders in St. Philip's Moravian Church. So welcome everyone and thank you for inviting us to be part of this, this wonderful conference. And I believe that um, you've invited me to ask uh, Dr. May Rodney and Professor James Blackwell, um, as well as our, our keynote lecturer, the Reverend uh, Dr. Winnell Curtin Roberts to, uh, to introduce themselves. So Dr. Rodney. Thank you. Uh, my name, as you indicated, is May Rodney. One minor correction. I met uh, my dearly beloved husband in 1983 when I, came, when I arrived at Winston-Salem State. And we married in 1984. Um, so we were partners for almost 29 years. Um, it was a very interesting experience um, to be married to a Moravian minister, and he would always tell everyone that he was born and not a converted Moravian. He was born in South America, a uh, guy of South America. And thank you for this opportunity to share information about all of his work uh, that he did at St. Philip's. For 40 years, he was the chaplain at uh, Winston-Salem State, was he not? Yes, that was his third love, <laughs> Winston-Salem State. I'll put me a little bit above the university. <laughs> Good. Thank you for joining us. Cynthia, you want to introduce uh, your, your fellow faculty member? Yes. So joining us this evening is Professor James Blackwell. He is um, a doctoral candidate at uh, Michigan State University. He'll be defending his dissertation anytime soon. Uh, he's a native born uh, North Carolinian. He graduated with his first two degrees from our sister school, North Carolina Central University. He is the student of the most gracious and inspiring um, historian, one of my heroes, Dr. Enwando Achebe. Um, so he's studying with her. And uh, we're just so delighted that he's joined us this semester in our history program. Thank you. Would you like to make a few comments? Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to be here uh, tonight. I look forward to moderating the discussion and I'm deeply passionate and fascinated by the relationship between uh, Black Moravians and just this German, German diaspora. Thank you. And Dr. Kirton Roberts, uh, I would like to just say that we're joining you this evening and it's very special that you are with us because uh, you are joining virtually so many North Carolinians. So your long lost distant aunties, uncles, cousins, nieces, and nephews. It's often um, forgotten that the first people of African descent who were brought to the Carolinas both what is now North Carolina as well as South Carolina actually came mainly from Barbados. And in fact, the Carolinas were seen um, initially in the earliest colonial period as a colony of a colony. Uh, and so it's, it's very special that you are joining your, your kin 
um, both your spiritual kin and your blood kin. And, um, and I think that that is quite relevant for um, what you're going to be teaching us this evening. So, so welcome. Would you like to make a few comments? Uh, yes. Thank you very much, um, Cynthia, for your most gracious welcome. And it is certainly an honor to be here with you. It is 1.13 a.m. in Geneva, Switzerland. And I'm um, really, really honored to be part of um, the presentation this evening. And thank you for that connection. I've often only made the connection between um, Barbados and um, I think it was part, part of Atlanta. Atlanta. And um, I didn't really make that connection. So that is something to be pursued. So I hope that everyone will be able to reflect because the story that I've shared is, yes, it's historical, but it's very personal as we seek to understand and connect um, the pieces together. So it's really great to be here. Thank you. Well, before we um, watch your lecture, um, I would actually like to read your bio. Many people might not have seen it on uh, the conference website. So the Reverend Dr. Winnell Curtin Roberts is a native of Barbados where she completed her primary and secondary education. She earned a BA from the University of the West Indies, Jamaica in 1992 and graduated from the United Theological College of the West Indies, Jamaica in 1993. She was blessed with a World Council of Churches scholarship to pursue her Master's of Theology. And, at this, and so the Princeton Theological Seminary was blessed to have her there um, in 1995 and 1996. Following this, she completed her PhD in history from the University of West Indies Barbados in 2009. She is an ordained minister in the Moravian Church, Eastern West Indies Province, and has worked in Trinidad, Barbados, and the Virgin Islands. She, she served as superintendent of the Sixth Conference from 2008 to 2014, and secretary of the Provin uh, Provi Provincial Elders Conference of the East West Indies province. Dr. Kirton Roberts taught Caribbean church history at Coddington Theological College from 2001 to 2006, philosophy, ethics, and religion at Barbados Community College from 2001 to 2006. In 1997, she published her publication, um, which included Vision for Mission, for the Moravian Provincial Board, North American Province, and her monograph, Created in Their Image, Evangelical Protestantism in Antigua and, Antigua and Barbados, 1834 to 1915. That was her dissertation, and then it was published in 2015. She's also contributed numerous entries to the Encyclopedia of Christianity in the Global South um, and, and on many islands in the Caribbean. Before we see the video, um, I would like for us to just consider a few things. Um, one is that as we listen carefully to her lecture, we'll see that it's framed in an Africana religious studies context that she doesn't actually name, but it is there. And what is so important for us to pay attention to in, in this way is that number one, beginning about 10 minutes into the lecture, she situates African Christianity within the, what becomes normative Christianity. So you can't understand church history without understanding the, uh, the great contributions of early church 
uh, mothers and fathers. And so she brings that up, which is so very important. Also, a part of Africana studies teaches us to learn not only with our mind, but also with our heart and our spirit. And if we don't learn in that holistic way, we are not learning. Uh, and so that's part and parcel of the Africana approach. And then notably, what she teaches us in this lecture is that we must never fall into the various dangerous, the various, a various dangerous potential trap in history. And that is that we can go back and, and reshackle people. And so we have to be very careful to not present them in the image of their oppressors, but rather to try to find and empathize and find the truth of who they were and their agency. So I encourage you to listen to those, um, to those arguments um, and those teachings. And then finally, in keeping with, I think, a very important practice, which is the daily reading. The daily reading of the Moravian Church for today is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in wisdom. And you will, Dr. Kirton Roberts, be teaching us so much wisdom. And then lastly, I want to sanctify um, our listening and learning of the wisdom you'll share with the passage that is, is part of the Orthodox Church reading for today. And that is, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And if we remember the teachings of the great liberation theologian, James Cone, we'll remember that he says that all true Christians and all believers will see um, see Jesus as a black slave, that black is beautiful, Africanness is beautiful, and if you are a, a true believer, you will recognize that, the holiness of blackness. Thank you. Do you want to talk to us about how uh, the transition tonight's going to work? Okay, so Everyone who registered received an email with a link to the video page for our conference where the videos are posted. And you can use that email link now, or if you want, please drag your cursor to the bottom of your Zoom screen and you'll see an icon that says chat. If you click on that chat button, I am now going to enter the link for this video. Please click on that link and it will take you to the web page with the hosted videos. And you will want to find the video that is titled Black People, White God, Arabianism, and the Cultural Purification of the Afro-Caribbean and Antigua and Tobago. So I'm entering that in now. Hopefully everyone has found that and we got it. Did that show up, Eric? Did you see it? Yes, you're there. Right. Okay. So please go ahead and click on that link. Um, we, How long do you have on the timer tonight, Grant? Um, I have a one hour and 20 minutes, and that will leave people roughly two minutes, three minutes to get uh, to find the video page, to click on the video, to get it up and running. And that will also give people about three minutes to gather themselves and to come back to the Zoom meeting. You do not need to quit Zoom. You can go ahead and just click into the different window that opens up when you click on that link. And so go ahead and leave Zoom running. We will shut off our cameras so you don't um, see us watching the video and we will shut off our microphones, uh, but we will all be here. We're all watching the video at the same time. So uh, with nothing else, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the video. Hello. James, I see you're there somewhere. Uh, yes. we'll welcome everybody back. Um, thank you for very informative tour of uh, the Caribbean and those two particular places and their arc of their stories. 
Um, James is going to be leaving our moderation for uh, question and answer this evening. Um, James, I'll give it over to you as soon as you're able. There you go. I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I just want to start off by saying I was fascinated by uh, the entire lecture, and it really reminded me of a discussion I had uh, Wednesday with so many of my students as we kind of talked about the Atlantic world and Christianity in the Atlantic world, and as we tried to complicate the experience of Africans and their relation to uh, conversion. And so it also drew my attention to the way in which uh, the Moravians were fascinated by the drum, but at the same time, they tried to not necessarily outlaw the drum, but the way in which they viewed it somewhat negatively in the same manner in which they tried to convert uh, the Antiguans to Christianity, uh, but trying to discount their own religions, but also being fascinated by the way in which they Africanize their Christianity. And so the initial question I had, and perhaps it's a bit beyond the time scope of the lecture, and you mentioned it briefly, would be what drew, one after emancipation, what drew them to things like Anglicanism or Catholicism? in lieu of being Moravian? Because you mentioned it briefly. Well, in terms of, um, thank you very much for, for, your, for your thoughts. In terms of Tobago, it was more a practical um, matter um, when, the, when they were drawn to the Roman Catholic Church. What happened is that the funding to the, to the mission had been reduced so the, the, the black population, the members, the Moravian members were asked to, to raise funds. And so the, the emphasis now became how much can you really bring? Mm. And um, so when they found that burdensome, the Roman Catholic Church um, re-emerged and they offered this free church. You don't have to pay fees. You don't have to be raising all these funds. And um, they felt more, more welcome. So there was in the diaries, um, the, this constant complaints from the Moravian missionaries that the Moravians were leaving. So I'm not sure, I don't think it was so much as a cultural as it was a financial um, issue. I can. I, I'm sorry, I missed that. I don't know if anyone got what you said. Yeah, I couldn't hear it either. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was saying, how much time do we have? I want to make sure I, I get as many questions as, as we can. Yes, I think we're, we're good for a good 20 or 30 minutes here if we, if we have our okay. questions. All right, I'll go, I'll go to the first question. Or do I see one? We'll say that, uh, Dr. Rodney is not uh, had to had to leave for another event. Dr. Rodney's um, husband, uh, Reverend Dr. Cedric Rodney, uh, is from Guyana, and of course, there's a. Uh, uh, I would assume that many of the points that you uh, explore it with uh, detail and examples from these two islands are actually uh, uh, issues across the uh, Moravian mission field with uh, uh, African descent people. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's true. I think what initially fascinated me about Tobago was the fact that they were one of the first to um, introduce the, the drums as part of the Sunday morning worship, and it was acceptable. And um, that's only a recent, um, a, a relatively recent phenomenon in the other conferences, and I wondered why. And then I realized that one, they didn't have this long um, colonialism period, so they were very free to be. And then number two, you know, the Moravian mission started much later, so they were more, um, um, Tobagonians were more connected to the African culture, wherein by the time the Moravians came to Antigua, they were already be so Europeanized. Um, it was easier for, for the mission um, to take place and to, you know, continue to, to, to impart the, the, the Christian religion. I know from some of my own research, I was quite fascinated by the way in which after emancipation in Jamaica, for example, missionaries took it upon themselves to return back to places like Fernando Po in Nigeria and convert other Africans to, to Christianity. Did the same thing occur for Black Mora Moravians after emancipation? 
you know? Um, during the 1840s, there was a back to Africa um, movement, sort of. And that's because there were some indigenous members of the populations who were willing to, who wanted to be in ministry. And it was felt at the time that the best place for them was to, to go to Africa rather than be in ministry in the Caribbean. I have part of that in my, in my book, um, which I talk about about African um, movement. But of course, you, you know, later down that came with persons like Marcus Garvey, Pan-Africanism and that connectivity um, with Africa. But in terms of the, the missionaries, um, they felt that if the indigenous person, the black person wanted to be a, a pastor or, you know, priest, a leader, the, the best place for you to go is go to Africa, mm. you know. I understand. I think we may have a question in the chat. So uh, Dr. Donna Brinson from Winston-Salem State says she's always heard that Moravians from old Salem were pacifists and that some were abolitionists. Was this different from Antigua and Tobago? Um, I am not sure about the abolitionist part <laughs> um, because the, the Moravians never quite got involved with any kind of movement to, to abolish slavery. In fact, I was reading um, a dissertation a couple of weeks ago um, and I do not recall the name of the of, of the candidate, but they not a dissertation. Yeah, it was a, it was a doctoral student, but the person is making the case that um, based on two revolts that occurred on the island of Saint Croix as well as the island of Saint Kitts, that the Moravians facilitated the whole process of abolition. And quite honestly, I couldn't follow the um, the argument because, I mean. For the abolition, for example, for the slavery vote that took, it, took part, place on St. Croix, the Moravians were called upon by the government to stop the, 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 the enslaved population from, from rebelling. So the Moravians always took pride and joy wherever uh, on the islands by saying our slaves kept quiet, our, our, our slaves did not rebel, our slaves didn't participate, you know, it's like our slaves weren't part or our, our members were not part of the protests or anything like that, you know, that that was the joy because the, the whole purpose of the mission was to ensure that you were a good enslaved African. Keep yourself quiet, you know, be nice, you know, don't resist anything, don't, 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 don't question what is happening. Don't question your your state of being. Uh -huh. Okay. I'll go to another question here. Uh, Sally Hirsch said, have Moravians ever lived in Africa? And how did Moravians adjust to a tropical environment when coming from a mountainous area in Europe? If Moravians ever lived in Africa, let me see that. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's what she's asking. And uh, it's, it's a multi-part question. The I can read it again. The third part is, what were some of the specific Christian traits that were visible uh, in Africa, coming from Africa? Uh, uh, well, let me try to first answer the first question by saying that they, they, in terms of the Moravians in Africa, there were early Moravian missions in Africa and beginning in, in, in South Africa. And that was, I think, what, 1750 something? I don't know the exact date, someone else who's more knowledgeable will be able to say exactly when that was. So that started there, but the, the real growth or a major expansion, I should say, took part much later um, with the missions in um, East Africa, primarily in um, Tanzania and the environs. Um, how did Moravians adjust to tropical environment when coming from mountainous areas in Europe? I think this was quite problematic as it was for, for several other colonists because um, adapting to the, 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 um, the, the warm weather, very often you will hear of Moravians returning to furlough because of ill health. So it was generally a challenge to tropical um, diseases and so on 
often um, took their toll on the, on the Moravian missionaries. Also, what are some of the specific Christian traits that were visible in Africans coming from Africa? Um, in terms of, I, you know, there were references, for example, to the making of the cross and certain aspects that might have lingered among the, the African population, but it's not necessarily clear that it was quite prevalent, as well as some Islamic traits as well. Um, but to say that they were African, I mean, all dark, for example, he did some descriptions um, in his book where, you know, he was able to detect that there must have been that kind of connection. And there's several other persons who have made those connections um, in recent research. Okay. I think uh, Dr. Benson had uh, another question that I think is quite fascinating. And um, okay. she, she says that in the U.S. we have a genre of music created by enslaved African peoples, the Negro spirituals. And do, do we have remnants in Tobago or, or Antigua of similar type of uh, music uh, spirituals? We would not necessarily use the word Negro spirituals, but what I would say is that the eventually the Caribbean rhythms evolve into sort of indigenous types of music, which were quite um, unique to, to each island. But overall, you have the two main um, genres, I would say, main Calypso, which is tend to be more Trinidad and Tobagonian and Antigua as well. And then you have the reggae, which tends to be more um, Jamaican. But by the time we get to the, like the 1960s, we began to add um, Christian words <laughs> to, uh, uh, the, this, to the music, to the beats. So we have um, a number of what we call, you know, the Caribbean sounds, um, Caribbean, Caribbean rhythms, um, sounds that reflect who, who we are. So there is no broad thing as Negro spirituals, but eventually there were our own indigenous sounds that we wrote to, to beast. And of course the steel pan was one of the things that really took over the mo most of the Caribbean evolving well, there's a debate as to whether it came from Antigua or Tobago. Antigua has credit for it. Tobago, Trinidad, Tobago, believe is there in the birthplace. But I can say that widespread, and especially within the Moravian churches, there, there's definitely that steel pan element. And mm -hmm. that rhythm is, is, is used extensively the last 20 or 30 years. Okay. 20 years, I, was always, I, say. I was always struck by, I kept thinking about the differences in islands as I was listening mm -hmm. to the lecture and, and whether or not that would come into focus uh, and, and your comment made me think of that. Uh, Dalim Beck uh, has an interesting question. Was the experiences of Moravians and the local people of St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix and St. Kitts in the 1740s similar to the experiences the following century in Tobago and Antigua? if it was similar, if the experience, well, I think to some extent, um, there were some similarities, except that they were under different colonial rule, I would say. Um, and the, the, the forms of, of, of slavery um, were different. It was said that, you know, the British form of, of, of slavery was, um, was the harshest <laughs> of all because the whole point was to extrapolate as much labor um, without much care about the well-being of, of, of the African. Um, in terms of the, uh, of the Moravians, um, of course, the Danish islands, they were out front. They were, you know, 1732, 1740, 1750. But Tobago really got started in the 19th century, really. So things were much um, different. They were more, you know, established and settled and had a, a, a different kind of, a, of approach. So they were more, more self-determined, I would say, uh, more protective of who they are than um, those in the, in the Danish West Indies or Barbados, Antigua. Okay. Um, Larry Tice has a very interesting question. He asks, uh, were the Moravian missionaries on the island subsidized by the government in a similar fashion to the way they were in the U.S.? 
And if so, what percentage of missions were paid for by a government? I know what well, I'm not sure that the missionaries themselves were subsidized, but in terms of the schooling, eventually um, there was significant um, subsidy. I, I, when when that was reduced in um, in Tobago as well as Antigua, it was very difficult for the church to to continue. So there was that kind of subsidy. But in terms of the church, was really called upon to be autonomous from the 1840s ready to sustain its mission and they, that, they found that to be extremely um, difficult. And in a, in a paper I would have done at Moravian College about two years ago, I spent some time tracing the, um, how the American mission came in to help out. And there was a great financial help to the Eastern West Indies. And that really started like from the 1950s because in the, the West Indies, we were struggling financially to take care of ourselves. One of the interesting features I found when I was looking through some of the records, and maybe someone has some further information and I can look at it even further, but I noted that in Europe, that there was a point where the funding was redirected to, to the Moravian diaspora in Europe. And because they used that funding, they reduced whatever little funds that they had come into to the West Indies. So at that point, they say, you know what? You need to raise your own funds. You need to raise your own money. You need to pay your own fees. You need to sell more and, and so on and so forth. So that subsidy was not there generally, but with the schools. OK. It, all, it always involves money somehow. Someone has mm -hmm. to pay for something. Um, Susanna Lovejoy uh, has an interesting question in relation to drums. And the question goes, I'm curious about the communication by drums, which is a centuries old practice that long predates the invention of the telegraph. Do uh, Blacks in the Caribbean still use the drum to communicate and would they understand what the drummers were communicating in reference to the way in which drums are used as, as a language or as a call to arms? Yeah, I do remember when I was in school in the 70s, <laughs> uh, they started to introduce um, African reintroduce African culture and to try to explain to us some of the African beats, the drumming and so on. I remember learning to drum and, and what, what each you know, part meant. But, but during the time you know, of slavery, they, they were able to communicate through the drums from estate to estate what they were going to do. And um, some people have written extensively on that. So if they were going to meet, or if they were going to, you know, rebel, if they're going to that, you know, there was a form of that kind of communication. Um, but in terms of what it means to our, our own culture, I think we had to reteach, you know, the meaning of, of, of the drum. So that's very, very um, common now throughout the Caribbean. There's a sense of understanding, you know, what these really be. And I, I can't tell you what the details are, but you know, they, they certainly do incite something emotionally within. And it's also very good that they're very much used now, as I mentioned, being spiritualized because the, the rhythm of in and of itself, you know, there's nothing let's say demonic about it as, as was advocated. Um, so by putting Christian music or, you know, whatever you want, you are able to combine a culture, your as well as you know uh, your Christian belief. Wonderful. Looking for some additional questions at the moment. I apologize. Sally Hurst, okay. has, Sally Hurst has a question, um, which is a hot topic. Are reparation studies still going on in the in, in the Caribbean islands? Yes, very much so. <laughs> um, I happened to be here in Geneva, Switzerland, and it was in December, I think it was November, December, I attended a, a lecture here in which Professor Hilary Beckles, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, he presented a, a paper on the uh, updating on the rep rep reparations. And um, I found it rather fascinating. As a matter of fact, I, I'm going to, um, reading that as well as some other information as to fully understanding 
you know, the whole principle of giving back. You know, his, his theory was that, you know, by the time we came to emancipation, you know, there was this compensation given, but it was not given to the, or, or the post or, or the formerly enslaved populations. It was given to those who were going to be suffering the economic losses. So the point is, and, and to use his phrase, you have to, Europe has to come back to the scene of the crime and to, to, to see what damage they would have done and how this would have benefited them and to invest in, um, in, in those persons that would have suffered immensely over the period of time. Of course, we talk about the Caribbean, but that's also very much in other colonized places. You know, we talk about the underdevelopment of, of, of Africa for the um, building up of, of, of Europe. And so the question is, how do you, you know, you, people have been left impoverished. How do you help persons now that your wealth has been built up? It's like, I took out as much as I could. My wealth is built up. I leave you to suffer, <laughs> you know, and to be, um, be on your own. And at the same time, you know, there are still so many, um, what you call it, taxes, so many things that are extrapolated from the Caribbean society when they can't even, you know, can barely manage. Wonderful. Um, Larry Tice asks, uh, was the African banjo as popular in the island as it is in the U.S.? In, as a musical instrument? African. The banjo, because it's throughout the oh, US. Oh, yes, the banjo. banjo. Yes, 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 yes. I, I did read significantly about, about, about that. Yes. Okay. Let me look for another question. I would like to ask a question that is a bit more uh, maybe theoretical, but through the documents, do you find uh, whether or not they emancipated or enslaved that they're conflicted with their Christianity? Because you spoke a, a, a bit about the differences between ethnicity and the directions that that form of Christianity takes, which I was struck by. But are people also equally conflicted by their conversion because they're converted to this, this white form of religion as they Africanize it? Mm. So there is that there is that continued conflict, I think, um, that struggle as to whether you're practicing an authentic form of, of Christianity and if you can be yourself. And why I mentioned the fact that even after the Moravians, as other Christian denominations, would go to church and do, you know, do the right thing as expected, particularly in our context. By the time they finish, uh, they go and do their own, <laughs> they're gonna do their own thing. And, 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 and we always struggle, for example, with things of, of a cultural nature, um, things like carnivals and cultural celebrations. Are they, you know, things that you can participate in? Whereas the, Euro the Europeans can go and enjoy whatever the European culture is, you know, um, whatever the musical genre, they, you know, it, 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 there's no real conflict there. But then, you know, to um, be participate in other cultural activities has always been a, a conflict, a struggle. But in Tobago, I found that, you know, they have this really great um, festival, this African festival that takes place in July. And what struck me about that is that they, the, the Christians participated freely. So there was really no shame. Where you, whereas you find that in places where the colonists stay for a long time, we still struggle a lot <laughs> with, you know, should I still dance? Should I move? Should I do this? Should I, you know, there's still that forever conflict um, in, in, you know, in interpreting the gospel and applying it to your daily life. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Vincent asks, if you could elaborate on the, the role of ancestors in daily religious practices. Yeah, um, I wanted to make the distinction between the superstitious, I would call it nature of ancestral history and the other aspects. So by the superstitious, you know, I, I refer to things like obey or we use different things. I mean, there's lots of explanation. I've read 
hundreds of pages trying to explain, you know, in terms of the ancestral superstitions, you know, from voodoo, you know, to, um, as I said, obeism and, and, and things like that. Um, but then there are other aspects, I think, like the medicinal one, for example, the different sort of habits, the, the storytelling, the oral traditions, um, these are, are, are things that connected you will hear about, you know, the Nazi stories, the different stories of that would have crossed the, the, the Atlantic. Different islands had different names, but the stories were so similar. Um, the, the folk music, you know, depicted these kinds of things, the, the travels and how, you know, the experiences that, that, that would have occurred. So by just separating and just thinking that all in terms of all of ancestral thing was, was, was demonic or, you know, um, not of God or not Christian enough, I think that there was a disconnect from the other aspects that sort of hold you, hold you together. Now, there remain um, a significant portion of that superstition, even within the, um, the, the Moravian church and Christian churches, and there is still that struggle today as to have people not go to, you know, maybe an OB person or some other person who can tell them something different. You know, some people still will, will, will trust that. I don't think it is that common within, the, within the, the, the Christian faith, but generally within the community, you still find persons who consult, you know, someone who will be a bearer of, um, or some ancestral religious leader. Um, and that's why in some places, you know, the Afro, Afro, Caribbean religious expressions have have evolved because they connected that kind of worship. Like as I, as I mentioned, the spiritual Baptist. You know, you have like Pocomania in Jamaica, Shangoism in, in Grenada, and, and and Rastafarianism, which is very common, which is very well known. You know, as as practices that connect the ancestral worship with the with the Caribbean with the Caribbean person. Mm. We go to another question briefly. Uh oh, here we go. Um, it, it went away. Um, Sally Hurst asks, "How are reparations for damages weighed with uh, the technological, educational, religious, and cultural developments that Europeans, Americans, and Caribbeans such as yourself have given throughout history, or throughout this history?" Can you can, repeat that? Yeah. And uh, we Let's might see if need, I can find it. Yeah, it's, it's down. So how are reparations for damages weighed with the technological, educational, and re religious and other cultural developments that Europeans, Americans, and Caribbeans have given throughout history? We might have to think about that. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question, but what I would say is that the reparations are not only in terms of giving money, but providing, you know, resources to individuals to, to be able to, to excel and to um, find ways to invest in businesses and so on and so forth. I don't know if that is the answer. If that's, I don't know if you can interpret the question for me. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that myself, and I, I think it might be in relation to what reparations are. I think sometimes people think about it, if it is monetary, if it's not monetary, and that might that might be some of the direction. But I don't I don't want to read too deeply into it if it's not fully what uh, Sally was meaning to mm -hmm. say. Right. So I mean, the, the thinking is that it's not just a monetary thing. Just not look at the price and say, okay, give two million dollars, but have ongoing investments and, and ongoing interest. Don't just, as I mentioned before, don't just leave the scene of crime, but come back and figure out how can I get persons from, from here to there. And this becomes particularly challenging, I find now living in Europe and the whole question of, of migration, um, because it, it's like you go into um, some place in the world, it's colonized, um, people have been displaced, uh, people have been impoverished, 
And then those persons are now coming back to the colonists. You know, they're migrating back there because you've take you've come and you've taken. I'm coming back to see. This is my simplistic way of saying this. I'm coming back to see what I can can get. You know, because and then that becomes a real, you know, a, a major conflict in terms of the question of of of, of immigration and on migration and you know, particularly in Europe. Okay. Yes, yeah, Sally elaborated a bit more, and, and she was referencing not just monetary, but the complexity of cultures that receive interaction in exchange from one another. So I think talking about migration, you kind of kind of alluded to it, at least at least a bit a, a bit of my thinking, and kind of complicated it. Right, uh, right, right. We have a question from it. It bounced. Uh, I was saying that they there is this. Um, it, there was a settlement in, in 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 Britain recently. Someone might probably remember. I think it was the Bush, the what's the name, the Win the Win Rush, a, a, a sort of settlement given to those persons who had benefited from coming, but then they were dis, they they were they they whole. Um, you probably know more about that, James. They were taken yeah, away. The, Win Rush, the, I think I, it was. Windwash was the boat in like 47 when uh, people from Jamaica and Barbados landed in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's what comes to my mind. It might be related to that. I don't know if it was a settlement connected to it, but I know that was the boat. Yes, uh, there was a settlement eventually um, given. But I think that the general, the, the whole conversation ties into that as to whether you should give a monetary settlement or if you should go back and invest you know, so that persons can have an equal chance mm. to, to be. That's true. I think we, got, we have time for one more question. And I'm going to take uh, the question from Carolyn Hasmith. Uh, and she says, from this history of Moravianism in the mission fields, how does that translate today into the future with the fact that the worldwide Moravian church of the 21st century's membership is primarily made of black and brown people with a minority of white and European members and institutions? Um, that's a very um, difficult question, but I do know that there was a working paper that came out about a year or two ago in which this, this, this became a, a, a reflection. Um, and there is current conversation as to, as to you know, rebranding, <laughs> as it were. When it's a rebranding, trying to figure out, um, you know, for example, you talk about the ancient um, unity, and then you come up and you talk about a renewed Moravian church. And the argument is that we need to find another term to address this phase of Moravianism that we're in. Um, when I did that research a few years ago in terms of vision for mission, and that was about 22 years ago, I, I had estimated at that time that the Africans had been about 80% of the Moravian population. I mean, that has probably probably be re realistically about 90% um, probably right now. So, but at the same time, I mean, the, the support, the financial support of the, the Moravian church is still heavily dependent on the um, European and American missions. So there's that, you know, sort of balance you have to kind of strike. And it, it, it does, it does, you know, it, it, it's a matter for conversation, particularly as we um, have like sinners and we have this one person, one vote, and we have, you know, persons, you can have Africans making up all the decisions and I guess whatever thoughts that they may have, that those are the thoughts that will probably um, go forward in terms of the of the Moravian Moravian church. So and and I use African here as they because sometimes it's the the um the thoughts are sometimes different, I suppose, are our thoughts are not always um, the same. Or you know, obviously, although we have some very strong um, um, similarities, and I guess because we were 
taken off. I've often said um, in the past, for those of us who are from the Caribbean, as well as African, the diaspora, I should say in general, um, you find yourself in that kind of awkward position because some, the you know Africans may not never, may not think of you as African enough, <laughs> and then um, you you you're in another part of the world, and um, some the Europeans came and sometimes say to you, "Well, you're not good enough." So where do you fit in? So that's the struggle that the Caribbean person I've, I've said that previously has had. I mean, here in Switzerland, and I meet persons with my my color as a black person. You know, they will ask me. So where are you from? Are you a African American? <laughs> are you um, uh, African from uh, European African, um, Caribbean African? Are you African African? <laughs> are you African African? It's about what does it mean to be African African? So there's that real emphasis. I am an African. Oh, I am African African. So you're a, a part African because you you know, you're there in the Caribbean and you, you know, you're African American, you're not quite African, or you're European African, you're not quite African. So that, there's still that hierarchical <laughs> structure within the African community. It's about that time. And I just want to thank uh, you, Reverend Dr. Kieran Roberts, for a fascinating uh, lecture. And then this is uh, a uh, inter, inter, in, entertaining and in, very informative discussion afterwards on a wide variety of topics. Uh, James, you did a fabulous job tonight. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, we're so grateful for the support of Winston-Salem State University in, in this conference. I want to remind everyone that we have another morning of uh, programming for you that uh, you can participate with. Uh, some of you may have already gotten an email tonight on some of our materials early on. Tomorrow's lecture started at 9. It's at 10. I don't think there's a change in your link. Just click on it, but we'll be gathering at 10 o'clock to hear uh, John Sensbach and uh, uh, the academics who've been scholars who've been working in the mornings um, on papers. And then our, our final keynote lecture will be at, uh, what time is it tomorrow? 11.30, I think it was immediately after um, uh, the, the, uh, the Sensbach uh, group, but we'll be over by about one o'clock tomorrow. And that will be uh, from Professor Catherine Fall, who will give our final keynote lecture on Moravian memoirs. Um, from all of us here in Winston-Salem and Switzerland, good night. Good night. Thank you so much, Winnell. Yes, thank you, too. Thank you. Good morning thank to you, you, by the way, Winnell. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, your six hours are five ahead. So. <laughs> OK, okay yeah. good morning. Good yeah. morning. Take and time, time for breakfast, right? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. OK, take care. OK, take care. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.